Are you searching for answers? Discover your true identity. Stay tuned to Shalom World. Praying for things, God responded as he was showing me that he does exist, that he does want to get close to me, that he wants to know me, but foremost that he wants me to know him. Hello, I'm Father Luke Janssen. I'm a priest in the Dominican Order in the Irish province. I live and work in St. Mary's Pope's Key in Cork here in Ireland. St. Mary's is an officiate house, so it is the house where the, um, those who are interested in discerning the voc uh, vocation with the Dominican Order come for the first year. So it is a house with a vibrant community with a lot of young people. And so both in the church and in the community. We have lots of different ministries and it's lots of opportunities to really share the gospel both inside and outside. The north of the Netherlands would traditionally not be a very Catholic part of the country and my parents would be Dutch Reformed. However, that didn't really feature much in my upbringing. The country is very secular and when I went to primary and secondary school, I didn't really get any religion. There was no mention of God really and there was no prayers, there was no uh, religious classes even. So when I grew up, what I suppose knew about religion was just what you hear on television and then what you would pick up during the normal biology classes. And this was rather contrary to religion, especially if you learn the evolution theory, if you learn that we as humans can almost achieve anything nowadays and that there is no God, need for God at all. However, I do think that I always believed to a certain extent in something of supernatural but it wasn't really that important or relevant to my life. So after primary and secondary school, I went up to uh, the university and I did mechanical engineering. But I must have made some kind of a good impression because the research department asked me if I would stay on and do a two years masters by research. So I suppose it was always good to do more studies and I made some friends in Ireland in the few months I was there, so I decided to, to stay on. I did my research project with a multinational company here in, uh, was in Galway. So I went to the office and started my work there. But what really changed my life was that there was a colleague there who was also an engineer and who started to challenge me on my lack of belief in God. And as I mentioned, I did always kind of believe in the supernatural, but I didn't really believe in the need for a God. It wasn't necessarily that I, didn't, that I didn't believe that there was a God, but it was irrelevant to me. And I suppose what was taught primarily in secondary school is that we can explain everything that we know and that we see through science, through, uh, uh, through reasoning and evolution. So we didn't really need to postulate a God. I thought that religion was for those who didn't have anything else to hand, hang on to who couldn't explain why the world exists. But now in this modern world, we could. However, my colleague challenged me, even on the simple elements of thinking that the world just is here. Where does the world come from? I mean, everything we know that we see is created. So 
what created what is created. There has to be something that is at the beginning and is not created itself. And this is, as I later learned, uh, what Thomas Aquinas says is what everybody calls God. Also looking at the creation of the world, the universe, possibly the Big Bang, how the planets um, came to be, looking at the details of how life exists, how life started to flourish, looking at DNA, the complexities, adding up all the numbers of the chance that such a thing could even happen spontaneously. I had to come to the conclusion that it isn't really logical to think that everything we see just happened by chance. I had to believe that there was something of an intelligence behind it. As a mechanical engineer, I would work at designs. We use patterns to create things. And we can see those patterns in the world. It is interesting even to see that in microbiology, within our cells, we can see design patterns that we use in creating machines ourselves as well. And this kind of fostered the idea that maybe there is some kind of an intelligence akin to us in some kind of a way that created both the world and ourselves. After a few months of intense research and uh, working with my colleague, arguing and discussing, I had to come to the conclusion that it was more likely that the world was created by some kind of a, a, a being than that it was here just by chance. All the theories that suggested such a thing didn't really make sense to me. But to see that the world is created for a purpose and that there is a uh, that there is a reason why we are here. This started to become something that I, I really thought more logical to follow. So my colleague then kind of started to look at the Bible and Christianity, telling the story of Jesus. We looked again first at the historical accuracy of the Bible. Can we believe what it says? Can we believe all the things that are claimed about Jesus, who claims to be God. And it seems that, uh, from a historical point of view, this, this is all trustworthy. That the Bible is the most historical, trustworthy document that exists. But it also made sense to me. Because it is, does give us purpose. It does explain why we are here. It does explain um, so many things that we would just take for granted in life. But when we really, uh, we really think about it, need an explanation. And I do think the Christian faith, and especially the Catholic faith, does give that explanation to us. So at this stage, my colleague said to me, well, what if this God, this God that he now proposed, this Christian God, a God who loves, who created us out of love, who created us uh, with a purpose, what if he does exist? Then it would only be fair for him that he would show himself when we ask him. So he suggested that I would read a little bit of the Bible, which is the Word of God, to allow it to speak into my heart and to say a prayer each day. So I did. So I started to pray on my way back from work. Five minutes I went to the church, just asked this God who I didn't know if he would reveal himself to me. And I started reading a little bit of the Bible. And he said, do this for a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months, and see what happens. Be patient. But I didn't have to be patient, really, because very soon, reading the Bible just opened my heart. Things became more clear and clear to me. Praying for things, God responded as he was showing me that he does exist, and that he does want to get close to me, that he wants to know me, but foremost that he wants me to know him. I started to pray more, I started to believe more, I suppose, a gift that God gives us. And I started to really think about what this would mean for my life. So going forward then, I started to go to a prayer meeting, I met more people who were like-minded. Uh, there was quite a few young people at the time in Galway. And I learned about the Eucharist also. The Eucharist, as we celebrate the Mass, is the body and blood given to us uh, by, by Jesus. The wine and the bread that is consecrated during the Mass becomes the body and blood of Christ. 
And this reality, and especially studying it in the scriptures and looking at the Eucharistic miracles, confirming it in the world, really made me open my heart and yearn to a certain extent to also become part of the body of Christ and to really get close to God. And the only way I could do that was to be baptized, because I was never baptized when I was a baby. So I decided to be baptized and be received into the church. So when I was 22, I was received into the church, I was baptized, I had my confirmation and first Holy Communion all in one day. And then life, I suppose, as a Christian really started. But to a certain extent, this was, <laughs> was maybe an anticlimax, because those who have had conversions uh, can maybe confirm that in the beginning God is really close to us, He, he helps us, and obviously because we really want to, uh, He wants us to know Him. But then when I was baptized and when I uh, was supposed living a life as anybody else does, uh, as, a, as a Catholic, a lot of these, these signs and, and spiritual consolations kind of went away and I learned that, okay, our faith really has to grow deeper and deeper. So I, I prayed, I started to appreciate my faith as something that is not something that we always sense, but something that lives, lives more deeply in ourselves. Often we might use and describe it as a peace that, that becomes part of us, of who we are. Ask God what He wants me to do with my life. Because one of the things was, I suppose, this discovery for me had made such a change. Well, in a short testimony like this, it's very hard to describe all these things. But it was like we have all the little bits of glass of a, of a stained glass window, all the little bits of stone of a mosaic, and we have them all available to us, to my studies, to my engineering degree. But they didn't really, I suppose, form a coherent picture. While they were all beautiful in themselves and we can enjoy them, it was now that all these things came together to prayer and to being attentive, I suppose, to how God reveals things. The beautiful stained glass window became apparent to me. So to a certain extent, that was what life was. Life became complete and different. I really experienced in a different way. Even if it was at times still difficult, life doesn't change. But life had a lot more meaning to it. And this was an experience I want to share with others. Not living just day by day, from holiday to holiday, trying to build a career for no reason at all at the end, I suppose, because we don't remain forever in this world. I mean, sometimes it's not always clear what God really uh, wants us to do or asks of us. Like I said, the initial call for me that seems to me to be the call to join the religious life and uh, to give myself fully to God was fairly strong. But then in the year after, there were very little spiritual consolations. To a certain extent, it was just making the decision and, and go on with it. But naturally, through prayer, finding some kind of a peace with it, and also with the help of, for example, spiritual directors and uh, vocations directors. In this time, it felt that God was maybe far away. But at the same time, if we really pray uh, a lot, I suppose there's a little deep kind of change within us and we become more aware of God's presence. Again, maybe as a peace that is there. And even if that is not maybe the most exciting, we kind of know that, that God is at work and we have to allow that, that work within us to happen. When I joined, I decided that I, I would stay with the, in the novitiate the first year for at least three, four months. And if, I, if I, it wouldn't be for me, then I could leave. Because at least I knew then that I had tried it. That in the future, if anything in life wasn't going to be perfect, at least I didn't feel that uh, I missed the opportunity or I missed the call to a certain extent. So I decided to just to, to, to stick with it and see what happened. But once I really started the novitiate, I knew that this is what God was asking. In this time, in this year, we get a lot of time for prayer, for the sermons, and to kind of deepen, I suppose, our relationship with God. And it really discovered the depths of what, what we can achieve in prayer. To really allow God 
to, to transform our hearts and to realize that it is not about um, experiences or, or direct ways that God, um, God responds, for example, to our prayers, as happened in the beginning of my conver conversion, but to really kind of see that God is really slowly transforming and helping us in, in our lives and that we have to be patient with Him. After my solemn profession, I was ordained in 2014 after finishing my last two years of theology. And I was also uh, got more involved in youth ministry. With Youth 2000, for example, which I was already involved with before, but now as a priest I could really minister to the young people. That is something that I really have enjoyed over the years, to really work with young people. Well, and that is what I've done in seven years since my ordination. It's really something that has been really at the center of my ministry. So life as a Dominican is very interesting from that point of view, especially if we look at the different ministries, like for example, youth ministries. Because when St. Dominic founded the order, he did so because he really saw the need for preachers to go out to the people. So that is what we do as Dominicans. But what St. Dominic really put at the center was that it has to come from a place of prayer. So first of all, we live here in St. Mary's, a life of a community that prays together. And we have celebrate Mass together uh, as a community. And that is kind of the foundation on which we build. But another thing we do, for example, is parish missions, where we go to a parish for a week and be there and, and preach the mission, um, give same, celebrate Mass, uh, celebrate the devotions, adoration but especially here in confession, to be available for people to, to talk to us, to confess their sins, but also to get direction, I suppose, and especially uh, to the sacraments, to allow God to use us as instruments to bring the gospel to others. Apart from the, the various uh, different particular ministries, uh, there's, there's a lot of other things that happen as well. Um, one of the things I've been involved with a lot is the media, uh, well, since I joined really. So for the last 12, 13 years, um, I've done a lot of video production, live productions and things like that to really use, I suppose, any means we can uh, to, to further, to further uh, evangelization. So it's kind of a mix of, of all kinds of different things. And uh, I suppose my engineering background is, is handy uh, in some of those those ministries and those elements, uh, as well as, for example, like my, my current role, uh, partly in St. Mary's, is uh, just the practicalities of, of making sure that uh, the church is in good shape and things like that. So I can use my engineering skills uh, to the, that extent as well. So some will say that, like, God gives you, well, it says, in, it says it in the Bible, that God gives you your skills and you have to use them. So I try to kind of mix it up and, and use them as good as I can. Then apart from that, I suppose it's good to, to also get out. Um, one of my hobbies is uh, kite surfing, so I like to go to the sea. Uh, it's just a really great place for me to kind of really clear my head, um, to be out in the open, in the wind, uh, at the waves, uh, to, to be at the beach. So it is really a great, uh, it's a great testament to how God works, where in the middle of things, sometimes we don't know, God might be silent, or there mightn't be enough, a lot of, things happening in our lives. But if we look back, then we can see how God really works in the good times, but also in the struggles to give us direction. And if we really are attentive to that, he will really lead us. For me, from a place where I wasn't planning to leave home to end up in Ireland, from not planning to stay in Ireland to stay here and do a master's, and then bumping into somebody who tells me about God, be baptized, to live a life as a, a Christian, but then to be called to be a priest and in that way to be able to serve God in sharing the faith with others. To do God's will is really what brings us happiness. To allow that openness of heart, to allow ourselves to be inspired. 
And if that vocation is marriage or, or to be single or whatever it is, that will make us happy. If it is a call to the priesthood or the religious life, we have to be honest and accept that too. That if it is God who is asking us to do these things, that it is God who will make us happy. Prayer requires a real openness of heart, to really allow God to touch us, to really allow God to transform us, to really become aware of His presence in our lives. But that then brings us really to that place where we can truly discern God's will and that we can really discern the journey that is ahead of us. And to have that conviction, I suppose, that strength also to make the decision to follow it. So definitely an encouragement um, for, for every, everybody to, to really be honest, to open our hearts and to allow God to speak. To have that moment, as I did myself, when I realized that, yes, it is logical that there is a God that exists, but not to let it just be a thought in my mind, but to share and open my heart for him to transform me and allow it to change my life. God wants to change all our lives. We just have to open our hearts and to be ready to receive the graces that he wants to give us. And I just hope in this uh, very short uh, story of my life that it is a proof that God can do these things. He could do it for me. He can do it for everybody. We just have to give it a go. The work of Shalom is an essential part and a powerful part of the work of evangelization, of promoting the objective of sharing the good news of the gospel, the joy of the good news of the gospel and its promise of salvation in this life and beyond death in the new life of the risen Lord. Its evangelization of culture and civilization is a most important objective for the people of God and the church right around the world. In this 21st century, when the human family is battered by so many forces of change, of uncertainty, forces which seem to threaten and menace hope, the hope of the risen Christ and of the good news of the gospel is something which has to be shared not only between individuals, but with communities of peoples right around the nations of God's earth. May the Lord bestow his blessing on the work of Shalom, on all who are, so who are associated with it, and also indeed on all those who through their charity and kindness support its most important work.